I would like to introduce and welcome our speaker today, Marco Diocini from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So, um, I, if you didn't have a chance to, to read his uh, bio, just let me go and do it for you. So, Mark Olivier Diocini, or Marco, how we all know him, is a CFD analyst and developer in uh, Reactor and Nuclear System Division at Oak Ridge National Lab. He received his Master of Science and PhD 2010-2014, respectively, in uh, nuclear engineering from Texas AM University. And his dissertation was focused on numerical methods for PDEs using finite element method applied to single and multi-phase flow and uh, radiation uh, hydrodynamic equations. So uh, he also, during his PhD, he interned at uh, Idaho National Lab and gained experience with uh, MUS and RIOAP 7 system code. Um, after his PhD, he spent uh, one year in the mathematics department of uh, at Texas AM as a visiting scholar. Um, where he did some work on numerical methods uh, before moving to Oak Ridge National Lab. So he's at Oak Ridge since uh, January 2016. And over there, he's involved in um, with numerical, uh, numerous, many projects, sorry, focusing on CFD analysis and code development, including CTF or Cobra TF, NEC 5000, StarCIS M Plus, um, NIMS Workbench as well. So with that, um, let's welcome again uh, Marco. It's virtual, so we cannot talk practically. But uh, yes, Marco, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. And uh, you already know if you have questions, you can post those questions on in the chat during uh, the talk, and they will be answered most probably at the end. Thank you, Marco. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Avramova, for the for the introduction. So, uh, this presentation will be split in two uh, parts. The first part would be dedicated to some of the CFD analyses I've been doing, I've been involved with uh, over the past two years, and uh, the first one is uh, the design of an organic heat exchanger, and the second one is uh, the modeling of high recovery steam generator. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I will uh, uh, briefly talk about some of the development work we have been doing in the TH group uh, involving the NIMS workbench, uh, Prantam, that is a lattice Boltzmann method code, and also uh, some uh, Galer King finite element method solvers that uh, we are developing. Oops. So <clears throat> the first project. Uh, is uh, something that we completed during the last fiscal year. And uh, that was a project in collaboration with Eaton Corporation uh, as an industry partner. So this project was funded by the HPC for Energy Innovation. And just to give you uh, briefly some background, uh, industry write a concept paper that is then selected by DOE. And uh, based on that, they decide on not to fund uh, the project and then the money goes to a national lab to help industry solve some engineering problem. So um, the, the, what was proposed by Eaton Corporation at the time was to develop a, a direct contact heat, heat exchanger. And they wanna use a, a organic heat exchanger between uh, water and uh, uh, pentane, liquid pentane. So, the principle is that you have a uh, hot liquid water entering in contact with liquid painting, and then you have uh, vaporization of the liquid painting to gas painting. And uh, that's how you, you get this heat transfer uh, between the hot source and, and the cold, to the cold source. So the motivation be behind that proposal was to uh, take advantage of the waste heat. And by waste heat, they, they uh, by waste heat, they mean any heat source below 230 degrees Celsius. Uh, the challenge when you 
when you try to model uh, such a system is that first it's a multi-phase flow and you have uh, energy and mass exchange between phases. And then the second uh, challenge whenever you develop a CFD model is to be able to validate your CFD model against benchmark data, which is not easy to do, uh, especially if you don't have access to those data or if there is nothing in the published literature. And then uh, once you have the CFD model, we had to uh, come up with a new design uh, based on what uh, Eaton Corporation proposed. And you have a picture in the right hand side of the slide where they, uh, they proposed uh, a horizontal uh, heat exchanger, um, direct contact heat exchanger. And you have two liquid entering the system and then you have uh, one, one outlet and, and the gas phase uh, is exiting uh, uh, the system uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the outside, sorry, on the uh, purple arrow. So <clears throat> the advantage of su such a system is that you, you can um, transform energy, very low uh, heat source uh, to, uh, so you can recover waste heat. But uh, you can also design a system that is very compact and you also have very uh, like lower pressure drop. Uh, and uh, you can minimize uh, energy losses uh, due to, uh, for example, uh, a wall that is traditionally used in, in a, a heat exchanger. Uh, and so it has a lot of advantage, but the, the, the condition is that uh, it, it can only be used for uh, waste heat. So the first step in, in this project was to um, find some sort of benchmark that we could uh, use to validate the CFD model. So we came up, we came by this paper that is referenced in, in the bottom of the slide where they designed, uh, they have an experimental setup with a sparger at the bottom that injects a liquid paint in. And the uh, um, liquid paint and vaporized uh, when it comes in contact to the hot water. And the hot water is injected into the system uh, from the top. So the water is fed at 45 degrees C and the, the paint and is uh, saturation temper temperature is about 36 degrees if you, uh, if you are under atmospheric condition. So it's a very complex system because you have, first of all, it's a counter current flow. And, and when you model that uh, in, in star system plus, which is the, the CFD package we used, it's usually very difficult to get a, a stable solution, but you also have surface tension force to account for, account for and also drag force. And you can have some large scale turbulent interfaces phase change, like I mentioned earlier, and also the gravity force. So you have to account for all of this in, in your CFD model. So like I said, we use star CCM plus and the, the model of choice, the multi-phase multi -phase model of choice here was a volume of fluid model. So uh, the volume of fluid is, is well designed in star CCM plus to model this type of uh, multi-phase flow. It can support, uh, it comes with um, uh, source terms to model the mass exchange between phases, but also the energy exchange between phases. And it has a, a different turbulence model you can choose from. And also um, it has all of the source terms uh, and force them that we, we needed to model the, the physical phenomenon here. We use a transient solver, even, even though the, the you get some sort of a steady flow, we had to use a transient solver because the solution is too stiff and you, you have to develop the flow using a transient solver before you get to this developed flow that is uh, close to the steady state solution. So the mesh of the, the geometry is about uh, half a million elements, 658,000 uh, elements. And uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, the different geometries that we uh, looked into. So we investigated the, um, the flow behavior with three different nozzles, sorry, three different spargers, and uh, going from seven to 36 nozzles. And for each of those uh, spargers, we had uh, experimental data to compare against. So, <clears throat> This is what you, we get 
uh, from star CCM plus. So you can see the velocity magnitude uh, in the left hand side. And uh, the, the, again, the water, the liquid water is fed from the top as, and accelerates uh, because of the gravity. So you get this plum of uh, liquid water in the center with a, a, a high velocity. And then uh, again, for the temperature, and here we are solving for the mixture temperature because this is what you do in, in the volume of fluid uh, model. You solve for the mixture temperature. So you get to you see this plum of temperature with a higher temperature uh, near the, uh, the nozzle of uh, where the liquid water is fed from. What is uh, interesting, I think, is to look at the volume fraction of the liquid wet water, liquid pantene, also gas pantene. So the liquid pantene, sorry, the liquid water, uh, because of the high density, uh, and it has a larger density than, than the liquid pantene and the gas pantene, will uh, stratify at the bottom of the geometry. And, uh, and then you can see that the liquid pantene uh, is fed from the uh, nozzle, to, from the sparger, and then will accumulate uh, right above the liquid uh, water. And on top of the liquid uh, pentane, you have this gas pentane phase. Um, we have a zoomed in um, image or figure of what the uh, liquid, sorry, the liquid pentane volume fraction distribution looks like for the three different cases that we investigated. And uh, here you have to keep in mind that the mass flow rate is the same. So per nozzle, as you, as you increase the number of nozzles, the momentum, uh, the inertia is, is less, uh, de uh, decreases. And so uh, what you see here is as you increase the number of nozzles, the, uh, uh, the jet of liquid paint and, uh, breaks up very quickly. And then they evaporate and you still have some liquid pentane that uh, stratifies on top of the liquid water. So to, uh, sorry, to validate that, uh, the uh, only experimental data we had access to was the active height. And the active height is defined as the height, uh, uh, so the, the length or the height needed for the liquid pentane to be fully evaporated. So to do that, we, uh, we had to come up with some, some sort of criteria uh, to define and uh, based on, on the uh, uh, threshold volume fraction. Um, and so we, we did some uh, sensitivity analysis to the uh, with respect to, to the value. So when you, uh, when, you, when you want to extract the active height from your CFD solution, you have to define this uh, threshold volume fraction. So uh, when we uh, looked at the, the different active height, active length values, which are given here, you can see that the, the, the solution uh, can become uh, sensitive to uh, the, the, the threshold value that you, you specify in your CFD uh, model. So the, uh, the threshold value that we, we picked uh, from, um, uh, for the, to extract the active height is given in, in the left hand side. And we did that for three different mesh meshes. Uh, and and we, uh, there is a, we, we have a base mesh and we, we, we have a coarser mesh and a finer mesh as well. And the, so if you, I don't know if you can read, but the, Basically, the, the active length uh, extracted from the CFD simulation is about 16.6 uh, centimeter, which is very close to the 16.75 centimeter uh, from the experimental uh, setup. So we, we, uh, we performed the same uh, study for uh, the different, um, uh, for all of the, diff for all three spargers. Uh, from uh, seven nozzles uh, to 36 nozzles. And uh, the active length is reported in this figure uh, along with the experimental data. And so uh, you can see that we get a, a fairly good match. Uh, we, uh, we did, so like I mentioned earlier, we did this uh, sensitivity mesh study 
uh, M1, M2, and M3 for the, the seven nozzle sparture. And we get uh, a solution that is uh, fairly independent of the, of the mesh size here. We also get a, a good solution for um, uh, the, the cases with 19 nozzles and also 36 nozzles. Um, so, so that was uh, the uh, validation that we performed for the CFD model. This is limited validation, but we were also uh, limited by the amount of experimental data available to us. Here you have a movie of uh, what the solution looks like once the flow is fully developed. So you can see that the liquid pentane here is being ejected in the bottom. Uh, and then it, it accumulates uh, here and is uh, fully evaporated uh, uh, when, I mean, uh, fully evaporate uh, around an active length of uh, two, uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, what you see in the middle here, the, the, the dip is uh, caused by the, the liquid water that is uh, falling from, from the top. And again, it's, it's being accelerated by, uh, by the gravity. So the next step in that project was to come up with some sort of um, design or uh, new design for um, a direct contact heat exchanger. And uh, we went through a different set of uh, designs before we came up with the final design that is given here in the bottom. And uh, uh, for this final design, we uh, investigated the behavior, its behavior for different inlet temperature and also uh, mass flow ratio that are given in, in the two tables uh, in, the, in the left hand side of this slide. We uh, decided to go with a, a horizontal flow uh, as it was suggested by Eaton. It simplifies uh, the, uh, the next the simulation uh, easier, but it also has some advantages. You can use, uh, uh, you can rely on the gravity to separate the different phases. And um, uh, so if you look at the final design, you can see that uh, the liquid water and the liquid painting are being uh, injected uh, with different angles, and that was to uh, have a better mixing of the, of the two phases. And we also introduced uh, a second chamber that has a higher cross-section, and that was to facilitate the uh, separation of the gas painting uh, and the liquid water. You can also notice that the outlet of, for the liquid water and the gas painting is, is staggered, and that was mostly to prevent uh, the entrainment of liquid water by the, the gas painting phase. So <clears throat> in our first uh, study, uh, we uh, investigated, we looked at uh, how the, the design was behaving. And uh, here you can see what the, uh, you, can you can see the distribution of the volume fraction of gas painting. Uh, for different uh, mass flow rate, M1, M2, and M3. And you can see that uh, as the mass flow rate increases, you have the, um, the, uh, the, the distinction between the, the, the two phases is, uh, is, is less steep. So you have, you actually have, by increasing the, the mass flow rate, you make the, uh, and I forgot what I meant. Uh, you, meant you, you make the, the um, uh, sorry, the, the surface, here we go. Yeah, the surface between the, the gas painting and the liquid water unstable. And so that's why you have this diffusive interface between the two, the two phases. Um, here we, we, we also put it what the, uh, the ISO surface of liquid painting. And you can see that um, if you, when you increase the liquid water temperature at the inlet for a given mass rate, you have um, uh, active length that uh, decreases. And so the, the objective here, what we really wanted was to have to have all of the liquid paint and evaporate before we get to the second, before the flow, the multi-phase flow gets to the second chamber. 
So the, the objective that we had at the time was to reduce the active length. And to do that, we had to introduce some buffers. And so we introduced two buffers, um, sorry, yeah, four buffers actually, no, three buffers uh, in the first chamber to uh, increase the residence time of the, of the multiphase, but uh, also to uh, enhance the, the, the thermal mixing between the, uh, the liquid water and the liquid and gas painting. So here is what the, the numerical solution looks like uh, for the different uh, inlet condition. So inlet temperature and inlet mass flow rate. And you can see that um, as you increase uh, the mass flow rate, so from M1 to M3, you increase the mass flow rate and 50 is the inlet temperature of the liquid water that ranges from 50 to 95 uh, degrees Celsius. You can see that you have more gas pentane being formed in the system. So what we really want to have, wanted to have here is to have a, a, a complete separation of, of the phases of the liquid water and the gas pentane, but also complete evaporation of the liquid pentane. And that design seems to, to achieve uh, that goal. Uh, so here again, the, the, most of the mixing uh, happens in uh, prior to the first uh, buffer. And then uh, you, with the first buffer, you, you uh, increase the, the resident time and, and, and you, you have a better evaporation of, of the liquid paint. So <clears throat> what we looked at is uh, the superheat uh, as a function of inlet temperature. Uh, you have uh, in the left hand side, you have the temperature distribution uh, for the different cases that we run. You can see that as you increase the inlet temperature of the liquid water, you have a higher temperature uh, of the gas phase, of the gas painting phase. Uh, it, it's better seen um, I think the, the graph, the figure in the right hand side gives you a, a better a reading of what is happening. So when you have a, a, a buffer, you have a better mixing. And so you, you actually have, most of the heat is being used to vaporize, to vaporize the liquid painting. Um, and uh, while when you have less, uh, you don't have the buffer, some of the heat is being used to uh, superheat uh, the gas phase. The only case that uh, gives like a, a very high superheat uh, is the case for the highest mass flow rate, so M3. And in that case, you have so much heat that you, you, you can vaporize of the liquid paint and, and then use some of the heat to uh, superheat the, the, the gas phase. So that, that project uh, lasted for almost 24 months and we were able to design uh, I mean, build a CFD model to solve uh, the physics in the direct contact heat exchanger. We did some limited uh, data and also use that CFD model and, and the HPC resources we have access to to design uh, some uh, a new uh, optimal uh, uh, design. And, and again, that's uh, you know, it's based on trial and error here because uh, we uh, we tried many different uh, designs and, and came up with the final design that uh, I showed. So uh, all of this work was published in, in a conference paper that is um, uh, referenced here. The second project that I wanted to discuss here is for advanced thermal hydraulic model of heat recovery steam generator. And that project is in collaboration with APRI. Uh, the motivation uh, behind the, the, this project is the following. So you have a, uh, if you look at the heat recovery steam generators, you can, you can notice that they, they can be subject to oxide growth and solid particle erosion that is also known as exfoliation. So if you look at the figure 1A and, and that is a tube that is um, uh, inside the, the, the steam generator, if you were to cut open that tube, you will see this accumulation of 
uh, oxide uh, or solid particle erosion. So those, those solid particles can cause damage to the downstream components, but it can also uh, create some blockage uh, uh, when you restart uh, the, the steam generator. So being able to understand uh, where they form in the steam generator and how they form is quite important when you, you think of uh, maintenance and, and cost reduction. So the objective of this project was is to develop a CFD model that can predict the oxide growth in, in, on the steam side, so inside the tube of the steam generator. And then uh, we, we want to use that CFD model to provide recommendation on where we, we want to use oxide resistant alloy pi, which pipe, sorry, which are uh, expensive, but also uh, needed if we want to uh, reduce cost and, and uh, improve maintenance of the, of the plant. So the challenges for such a uh, uh, project are the following. The first one is the oxidation uh, reaction. It's a, it's, it's a very complex uh, process and there are many steps. And uh, to implement that in a CFD model, we need to rely on a macro model that allows us to predict the oxidation, the oxide growth or the oxide thickness, but without resolving all of the steps and chemical reactions that happen. The other thing is related to the geometry itself. So each tube of the steam generator is usually uh, recover, covered with fins that are welded. And that is shown in the figure B. Uh, you can see that those fins are wired around the tube and they are used to increase the heat transfer between the gas, which is a hot source and the, the steam inside the pipe. The penalty that you take when you do that is that you increase the pressure drop. Those are very small features, and whenever you want to mesh that, it will require a lot of elements. And so we had to come up with a way to reduce or to model the effect of the fins on the heat transfer and the pressure drop. So like I mentioned, the oxi oxidation model was our first challenge, and we uh, decided to uh, rely on a parabolic oxidation relationship that uh, was developed by Adrian Sabo. Adrian Sabo is on the team and is our oxidation model expert. Uh, we were able to implement it in Star CCM Plus and, and we uh, verified the solution uh, uh, with an analytical solution that was uh, that is actually uh, taken from, from the paper. Once that was done, we uh, developed a CFD model for the steam generator, steam generator itself without the oxidation model. So we, we had to rely on um, um, gas flow. Uh, we have to model the steam flowing in tubes, but also we, we have to rely on the conjugate heat solver to uh, model the, the heat transfer between the gas and, and the steam flowing inside the tube. So that was uh, VNV uh, using data from the published literature. And once that was done, we merged the two models, the oxidation model and the CFD model. And you have some preliminary results here on the left in the right hand side. So in the top, you have a distribution of the temperature and also distribution of the velocity profile inside a, a very small section of, of the steam generator. So the steam generator is made of multiple rows of, rows of tubes and uh, um, inside each row, uh, sorry, inside each tube in the bottom, in the bottom figure, you can see the oxide thickness in micrometer uh, being predicted by the CFD model. So that was a preliminary result just to see if we were able to, to you know, get those two models uh, work together and, and we, we get some satisfactory uh, results here. The second uh, challenge that I mentioned in, in the first slide is related to uh, the fins. And uh, to do that, what we decided to do is to use a porous media model approach. The idea here is to uh, model the effect of the fins using a porous, uh, porous region. So the, the area or the, 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 area or the, 
the volume occupied by the fin is actually uh, replaced by uh, a porous region that is correspond to a mixture uh, of, of gas and, and solid um, uh, and solid phase, which is uh, steel uh, for, uh, for the fins. Uh, doing that, we, we don't have to resolve all of the uh, small uh, geometric features. But when you do that, you have to rely on some source terms to uh, uh, model uh, the pressure drop introduced by the fins, but also the enhanced heat transfer uh, to uh, uh, model the, 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 the better heat transfer uh, from the fins. So to do that, we relied on, on a coupling between Dakota and Star CCM Plus. And we use the pressure drop and the outlet temperature uh, from uh, the CFD model with fins as our reference uh, values. And so what we did is we investigated uh, uh, three different inlet velocities ranging from four to 16 meters per second. And we were able to uh, uh, derive a set of source terms uh, that uh, were uh, uh, that we could use to recover the correct pressure drop and, and temperature um, outlet temperature using the CFD model with the porous region. So the when you do that, you actually save uh, quite a bit of uh, mesh elements. So uh, if you <clears throat> if you look at the number of the mesh, then the number of elements for the mesh with fins, it's about 23 million. And uh, it's about, so it, it comes down to 1.9 million mesh element per tube. And for the mesh with post media model, we, we get something about 0 0.3 mesh element per tube. So we, you have a factor of six between the, the two CFD models. That, come, that is quite important because uh, in, in, a, in a steam generator, you have hundreds of tubes to model. And so uh, for if you, if you were to model a few tubes, maybe it doesn't really matter, but when we get to the point where we have to model uh, a larger section of the steam generator, it will save us a lot of time and, and compute, uh, computational power. The, the other test we did was uh, to uh, look at how the, uh, if we could predict the pressure drop, the correct pressure drop and outlet temperature uh, for uh, different inlet velocities, so velocity, inlet velocities that were not part of the, of the training set. And here again, we get a, a fairly good match between the uh, pressure drop and the outlet temperature. So what we are interested in is uh, the temperature distribution at the inner surface of the tubes, because the uh, oxidation model that we implemented is temperature driven. So if you can, uh, if you get a temperature distribution that is similar between the two uh, CFD models, so the one with fins and the one without fins, but with porous media model, you should be able to recover the same oxidation oxide thickness. Uh, here I, I show you the, the temperature distribution for the with fins, with fins and without fins, and we get very similar uh, temperature distribution. So we are still in the process of doing some uh, more advanced comparisons between the two CFD models where we do a tube to tube comparison to make sure that uh, we recover the correct uh, temperature distribution locally. Here you have the velocity uh, magnitude. We, uh, we have a very similar uh, uh, distribution as well. And uh, here we have uh, the temperature of the gas uh, flow. And again, we have a, a similar uh, distribution and, and uh, extrema values. So this project is an ongoing project and uh, uh, the future work, like I said, we'll, uh, uh, we are plan for future work, we are planning on doing some uh, extensive tube-to-tube uh, -tube comparisons, uh, both for uh, friction velocity, but also uh, inner uh, temperature, uh, temperature of the inner tubes. Uh, and um, 
we are uh, currently testing uh, how this post media model approach uh, behave for transient cases. So going from full load to partial load. And uh, once uh, we uh, once we are, once we are done with that, we'll uh, model a, a section of a high pressure superheater, which is a section in in, uh, in the steam generator that is uh, more likely to develop to see uh, oxide uh, oxidation uh, on the on the steam side of the tube. So we have a publication on that work uh, that uh, will become available in a few months uh, uh, once the, the conference will, uh, will happen. I see there is a question. So do we answer a question now or? It's up to you, you can answer it now. Oh, well. Uh, Maybe you can answer it now. Since it's... Ah, okay, so, um, so the question is why use the outlet temperature and not the shape function of the temperature for the entire domain? So the, the outlet temperature um, tells you how much heat is re being removed from the, from the gas flow, but it will not tell you where, uh, like uh, it would not give you a, uh, enough information on the, on the temperature distribution in the domain. The thing is, you can make it, you can, you can probably use, uh, you could use some sort of surface average temperature for each tube and use that as a reference to uh, model uh, the different, uh, the, the effect of the fin on the heat transfer, but, uh, it will become very complex very quickly because here we're doing a study with only 12 full tubes. But if you, if you have to have different coefficients for each tube, it will become too complex. So we, we are hoping that by just relying on the outlet temperature and the fact that we, we have the same fins on each tube, it should be enough to uh, recover the correct uh, temperature profile. Okay, so the, the, next, uh, the next topic is uh, NIMS workbench. So the NIMS workbench, as some of you may know, is uh, being developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Rob Lefebvre is a lead developer for this uh, new tool. It's based on the uh, graphical user interface uh, that is used uh, for scale. It integrates uh, a lot of uh, different packages ranging from uh, uh, Neutronics to TH, and uh, it also integrates a lot of Moose uh, app uh, like uh, Bison, Marmot, uh, Relap, uh, not Relap 5, but uh, Relap 7 as well. I don't think it's, yes, Sam as well. Um, so <clears throat> we, I was personally involved in the integration of NEC 5000 and Dakota for this project, and uh, uh, NEC 5000. Uh, was integrated about two years ago, and we uh, we called it uh, the integration of of the NEC five thousand in, into the NIMS workbench is uh, called NEC for NUC. So NEC five thousand is a is a CFD open source CFD package that is developed uh, primarily at uh, uh, Argon National Lab. The lead developer is uh, Paul Fisher, as far as I know. And uh, it's a spectral element method code, and you can use it for DNS, LES, but also RANS uh, simulation. The, the, what is very particular about uh, NEC 5000 is uh, the workflow to run a, a simulation. You have to use multiple uh, source, um, sorry, files, but also you have to use multiple, a combination of tools. And so you have a multi-step multi um, workflow to get to to get your simulation to run. So the the idea of this project that was funded by NIMS a few years ago was to uh, leverage the NIMS workbench capabilities to simplify the workflow and uh, let allow the user to control that workflow from from an input file only. 
So instead of having multiple uh, files, we came up with this pawn file here, and and that uh, that can be used to set boundary condition, initial condition, and and has some post-processing capabilities. What you have to know about Nike Five Thousand is uh, it has a user interface that is a dot user file written in Fortran seventy seven. And this is what is uh, used to set boundary condition, initial condition. So you actually require request, you requ the user is has to implement its own boundary condition, initial condition, and also post pre-processing and post-processing tools in Fortran 77. So that project aimed at simplifying this workflow for the user and increase the usability of NEC 5000. As an example, uh, what you can do within the NIMS workbench um, is to, uh, for example, what we do for nec for nuc is to generate Fortran 77 from templates. So let's say that you have a user specifying a set of uh, inlet of boundary conditions. Uh, you can, uh, in the input file, uh, the workbench will uh, pass this input file and then using a template that were developed specifically for net 4 nuc will be able to generate the uh, Fortran 77 code that implements this boundary condition. And that is shown in the, in the green box in the, in the right hand side. So that work here was done by uh, uh, Joy when she was uh, interning at uh, Cruise National Lab and she, uh, she actually, uh, simulated or modeled the flow, turbulent flow in a pipe to uh, verify and validate the implementation uh, of nec 4 nuc So we, we picked the turbulent flow in a pipe because we have access to correlations and uh, to compute the friction velocity, for example. And here you, you can see what the NIMS workbench GUI looks like. You can, uh, you can open the input file, you can uh, show uh, the mesh, but also uh, what the solution looks like using the visit that is integrated to the NIMS workbench as well. Uh, as part of nec 4 nuc you can do uh, a fast Fourier transform analysis uh, that is usually done for LES and DNS to see if you recover the energy cascade. You can do line plots and also uh, plot the friction velocity as a function of the polynomial order and see if you, if you converge to a value. We also added capabilities to uh, uh, compute uh, the turbulent kinetic energy, uh, Reynolds stresses, uh, all sorts of things that are uh, done uh, when uh, computing or when uh, doing CFD analysis and, and making sure that uh, uh, you, you actually resolve uh, the, the boundary, lay the viscous layer and uh, also um, if you want to be able to compare against uh, experimental data, for example. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that uh, we also integrated Dakota. So Dakota is an uncertainty quantification and sensitivity analysis package uh, developed at Sandia National Lab. Um, so we, uh, the, the workflow here is, is quite advanced and uh, we, we wanted to test it uh, using NEC for NUC, so NEC 5000, and we we did a sensitivity analysis to uh, uh, parameters that are used to control the the large eddy simulation method that is uh, implemented in in NEC 5000. Um, so that that was a very good test because we uh, actually uh, were able to test the remote submission capabilities of of the NIMS workbench but also the coupling between uh, Dakota and any third party package. So what we did is we extracted the friction velocity from NEC 5000, we compared it against the value that we computed from the correlation. And then uh, we plotted the L2 error norm uh, for as a function of, we, we, sorry, we studied the, the variation of the L2 error norm for uh, different poly, polynomial order, uh, filter weight and, and filter cutoff ratio, which are the parameters that control the, the LES method in NEC 5000. So all results were post-processed with the NIMS workbench and they are shown in the figure here. On the top row, you have the L2 error norm 
between the uh, friction velocity computed by NECFA, predicted by NEC 5000 and the one from the correlation. And in the bottom, you have the friction velocity itself as a function of the different uh, uh, parameters. So you can see that the A2 error norm decreases as we increase the polynomial order, which is expected because as you increase the polynomial order, you actually refine the mesh. You have, uh, you, you can resolve smaller eddies and smaller sp spatial uh, uh, scale. And then uh, the filter weight and the filter cutoff ratio that um, uh, control the LES method. So uh, those values, uh, you actually have the L2 error norms uh, is very small when you have a filter weight of five, which is, uh, I, I think, correspond uh, to what is recommended in NEC 5000 and, and also a filter cutoff ratio of 0 0.9. So all of this is documented in, in a technical note that was accepted uh, in the uh, in NET. Uh, it was accepted with revision, so it's it's still uh, under revision. I just want to point out that we tested the same workflow with other packages like CTF, Star CCM Plus, and and OpenFlow. Okay, so that would be I think my last. Uh, section because I think I'm running out of time. So <clears throat> we we have been developing uh, a lattice Boltzmann method code for uh, a little bit over a year now. So that code was uh, written back in 2012. And uh, uh, last year we got some uh, funding to uh, up update uh, the Prantam, the lattice Boltzmann method code with the state of the art numerical method. So we also added a passive scalar equation to solve for heat equation. And one of the objective of this uh, uh, project is to uh, make Prantam run on a GPU architecture. So <clears throat> while we, during this project, we did a, a lot of different tests uh, to verify the implementation of the equations. We uh, tested the, the strong scaling and weak scaling, and you have the, the figure that shows the strong, strong scaling for uh, prime time code. Uh, we also uh, used uh, uh, the NIMS workbench as, as a GUI, as a graphical user interface for this code. And uh, one of the tests that we uh, did, benchmark tests uh, that we, we run for, for prime time is a 3D heated cavity. And that it's a typical benchmark numerical problem for, uh, for the lattice Boltzmann method code. So we, we investigated uh, the, the flow um, between two heated walls, and you also have the effect of the gravity. The Rayleigh numbers here um, varies from 10 to the fourth to 10 to the six. And uh, we, we perform both 2D and 3D simulations. And here I'm only showing uh, 3D results for the temperature and, and the velocity profile as well. So you can see that as the relay number increases, uh, the, the temperature gradient uh, gets uh, steeper near the wall, the boundary walls. And also uh, you can probably not see it here, but the velocity, uh, the maximum velocity increases as well as you uh, increase the relay numbers. Um, we did uh, some comparison against um, uh, some uh, published uh, values or published literature. Uh, there is, I don't think uh, there is no exact solution. So the only thing you can do here is to compare against uh, existing code and we get a fairly good match. So what you usually look at is the maximum value uh, that you, you, you get, uh, maximum velocity uh, value for each component, but also the location of those uh, uh, maximum values. So we get a fairly good match uh, for all uh, when we compare against uh, different references. So conversion to GPUs, that's something that we're currently doing and I don't, I don't have any results, but I wanted to uh, mention the, the workflow that we, the strategy that we adapted. Uh, so the, the objective is to be able to run the code on GPU platforms, so both Summit and Frontier. I think Frontier will come online in 2023. And, uh, but we also be, want to 
maintain the current capabilities for CPU platforms. So uh, Printem is written in 4190 and uh, the, we made the choice to uh, convert some, some part of the code to C++. Uh, those part, those sections of the code will be ported to GPUs only. And uh, uh, to do that, we're going to uh, rely on Reja, which is uh, a library uh, from uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And it allows you with um, minimum uh, modification of the source code to uh, port uh, some functions, so C++ uh, routines uh, to the GPUs. And uh, we think that uh, we should, should, should give us enough uh, speed up, um, even, uh, I mean, on the GPUs. Um, so, so I think that should be done in the next couple of months. Okay, I think I will stop here. Uh, because I have one more section, but I will not be able to finish it within the next five minutes. Thanks a lot, Marco. So uh, it's time for questions now. Again, you can post it on the chat or uh, simply unmute yourself and ask. So I can see two questions. Mark, would you like yeah, to hold on. I'm, I, I, yeah. I was trying to open the chat. Okay. Do you want me to read for you or? So, uh, Ziad is asking, what was the motivation behind the peculiar design of the direct contact heat exchanger with orifice in the center? and with a particular number of buffers. Uh, let me go back to the slide. So is that the one? Hi. Dixie, can you unmute yes. yourself? He says yes. Oh, okay. So we're good. Um, okay, so the number of buffers, we... Um, so I don't really have an answer for that, for the number of buffers. We, I think we tried different combination, more buffers, but uh, I think that was the one that was giving uh, the, the best uh, result. Uh, that being said, um, I believe you have to have some sort of um, minimum distance between each buffer if you want to uh, have a good uh, mixing uh, between the two phases, between the phases. And you are talking about this orifice in the center. So are you referencing to the converging, diverging nozzle? Yes. All right. So, the, the idea here was to, um, when you do such, such a design, you, uh, the, the nozzle here, you, you, you actually make the, um, you make it harder for the, for the multi-phase flow to go from the first chamber to the second chamber. Uh, and when you do that, you, you increase the, the residence time. So that was the idea. And also when the, the flow, uh, um, goes through the nozzle, you, um, we, we observe, observed a better separation of the, of the phases, uh, the, the liquid paint and face and the liquid water face. So that was kind of the, the reasoning behind uh, that, uh, like you said, peculiar design of the direct contact heat exchanger. Um, So Nile is asking, how do you model the porous region when trying to, re to get, trying to get replace the fins? Uh, so let me go back to, so I assume that's the slide you're referring to. 
Um, yes. So. Um, so the the porous region is designed to replace the the fins themselves. So. Can you can you elaborate on your question? I'm not sure to understand what you mean here, Nile. So I just wanted to know uh, how do you model the porous region? I mean, uh, is it based on the volume, uh, the solid so, volume fraction in that area, or something like that? So you mean how do I compute the porosity? Yeah. So the porosity is actually used. Uh, so when you when we model the pressure drop we rely on the four chimer source terms, which are designed to, actually specifically designed to uh, increase, uh, in, introduce a pressure drop in the pores uh, region. Now, to model the heat transfer, we relied on the porosity and the, the conductivity of the solid phase. So what we're doing is we're tuning the porosity and the conductivity of the solid phase inside the porous region in order to match to, to match the heat transfer between the gas uh, and the steam inside the tube. So the porosity is derived, is not set in, in the, uh, is not calculated from any physical consideration. It's just a tuning parameter that is uh, that will be uh, derived from the Dakota study, the Dakota optimization process. So uh, you would have to run a few experiments before setting the porosity for these models, right? Yes, you have to run a sensitivity study. You have to run the optimization study in order to get the correct combination of porosity and solid conductivity in order to recover the correct outlet temperature for the uh, different inlet velocities that we uh, studied. Thank you. So there is another question in the chat. Or yes. Um, So uh, Joy is asking slide 20, um, was mesh independent study carried out for the mesh with fin study? So we did a mesh study uh, for the CFD model with fins. And the the, the reference values were taken from the mesh that was showing uh, um, results independent of the mesh itself. So uh, when we were in, the, the solution was basically converged. So what I can tell you here for the, the CFD model with fins, you have to have a Y plus value of uh, one or beta one if you want to be able to resolve everything between the fins. I mean, the. The, the geometry has such small features here that you need a very, very fine mesh and your, your Y plus value is very small. That being said, if you, if you start, if you, if you extract the reference values from a so solution that is not converged and use that as a reference value in, in the uh, model with the post media region, then you, you're gonna you're gonna find you're gonna get coefficients. You're gonna tune the coefficients to match those uh, values, and so yes, it will affect the uh, the post the, uh, the 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 value or the prediction from the post media model. So I think we have a time for one last question. If somebody wants to take it. I have another question about uh, meshing. Yes, Dave. So in the, the first study with the uh, pentane and water heat exchanger, um, you did talk about a mesh refinement study. Um, did you ever run into um, 
mesh problems at the liquid uh, pentane water uh, interface. What do you mean by mesh problem at the interface? Did you, I, don't, I can't quite tell from these images, um, but were there any, any numerical diffusion issue, issues at the interface? So we, <clears throat> so what we did is uh, we used a very fine mesh in the ro location of the interface. Okay. Because, because we knew where, where it was, right? So we, we use a very fine mesh in that uh, section of the geometry uh, just to be able to, to resolve the, the interface between the, two, the different faces. Okay. And by assuming where it was, did that have any noticeable effects on the solution? So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if, you, uh, if your mesh is too coarse, uh, in the region of the interface, yes, it will affect it. But then you, you refine it and refine it further until you get to a point where the interface no longer moves. So we did that study to get, to, to get the correct mesh density in order to resolve the interface and make the interface uh, insensitive to the mesh uh, size or density. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go for questions. If there's anyone, I don't see anything, and we already are after 5 p.m. So let's thanks Marco again. Thanks, Marco. It was very nice talk. Any Thank questions? You. And um, we were very glad to have you here. Thank you.